portion of my life has been all about action, which still holds true. But now I pour all that time and energy into wildlife conservation, education, and the pursuit of knowledge. This is Camp Tenor. So when you think of dragons, none more come to mind than the living dragon behind us, the Komodo dragon. And Clyde, this has been a long time coming for you here at your park, hasn't it? It has indeed. Uh, these, these animals, we have a male and a female, they're brother sister. So we would not want to breed them. We need to find an unrelated male or female to match up with the opposite uh, sex that we own. And uh, they hatched in LA Zoo. They're about five years old and uh, they're still growing. They're still growing. Now this animal here is already a formidable uh, hunter and powerful animal. So it's only five years old. How big, at what point, does a Komodo dragon cease to be uh, a hatchling or an animal that's that's manageable and you really have to start taking precautions with it? Well, this size is potentially dangerous okay. that we're looking at. This is a female, she's not as large as the male, but they occasionally, the males get up to 9 feet, 130 pounds. After gorging themselves on water buffalo, they might be another 50 pounds on top of that for a brief period. But they're, uh, they're found in Indonesia. Indonesia has like 17,000 islands that make up the nation. In the Lesser Sunda Islands, down on the direction of uh, New Guinea, uh, right in this area, there are five islands that currently have populations of Komodo dragons. And uh, the only island that's not part of the Komodo Island National Park is uh, an island called Flores, and I suspect that all of the captive dragons that we have here in the United States originated from Flores stock. Now that's interesting, you know, there, there are different islands. Are there any subspecies recognized of Komodo dragons, or is it one species? No, no subspecies at the, the moment, at least. Um, and I haven't heard any rumors that anybody's proposing they split them up. But it does seem to me, if I look at the dragons from uh, Rincha, for example, they're not they're not exactly the same color. There's, there's been some, uh, not speciation, but some genetic, genetic diversity. Drift, you know, yeah. And uh, they're not quite the same as those you see around the, the ranger station on the island of Komodo. Because what I like about, you know, uh, again, with your education here at the park, you know, we're talking about giant animals on small islands. That's and right. in the Galapagos, for example, you know, there are different subspecies of Galapagos tortoise. That's why I asked that question. Maybe, you know, there is some kind of adaptation between the islands and these animals. Well, we, we used to think of these as island giants. Okay. Uh, some islands produce dwarfs, some produce giants. However, within the last decade, uh, they have discovered a fossilized monitor lizard on the mainland of Australia that's 10 times bigger than the largest Komodo dragon. So this may be a dwarf. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> Who that's knows? incredible. Yeah, well, certainly not Let, a dwarf. Let's go in and feed the, uh, the big male. Oh, well that would be interesting. <laughs> let's do it. Uh, this is not a dwarf, folks. And let me tell you, a big difference between Slinky, my Asian water monitor, and this animal, on huh? night and day, when you say you've worked with both. Yes, yes, I have. And before we go in, another thing that I'd like to touch on, which is so cool about you, uh, you've actually been to Komodo. A couple of times. A few times. And uh, I, I have taken groups there. I lead safaris to uh, South America and Asia and Africa. Uh, we're going to Namibia and Botswana this January. Oh, I definitely got to hang out with Clyde a little bit more, man. All right. Well, very cool. Well, let's go in and have a look at how you built this enclosure because, again, we are in Pennsylvania, so we do get some cold winters up here. And let's go see the big boy. So now we're inside the new habitat here that you've constructed for the Komodos and this is definitely the big boy. How, how long is he at this point? I think he's probably around six and a half feet and, and uh, he'll add some more bulk and length. Uh, he'll probably top out, I would guess, at seven and a half, eight feet. Even though there are Komodos that got to nine feet, not all Komodos are going to get that A large. very well-fed, unlucky Komodo might get that big. Now, 
This is an incredible habitat. Again, I go on about the way you create habitats, and you're known for that with your traveling uh, uh, exhibits. Now, with this in particular, just what kind of undertaking was it for you to get ready to even house these animals here in central Pennsylvania? When we knew we could get them, we began planning uh, a building. This is a double block wall building with four inches of insulation in, in between the blocks. There's a foot of soil on the roof and there's a garden up there. Really? It's a green roof. We have skylights so they get as much uh, natural light as possible. Although in the winter time, sometimes the snow covers the skylights. Oh, I see, yeah. But uh, the habitat, the mud banks, is a gunite, concrete. The rocks are molded concrete, fiberglass mix. And uh, we try to duplicate the environment as much as we can. Uh, the temperature in there is just like it is on Komodo. It's about 100 degrees. And it's warm in here. Yeah, I mean, you and I are both sweating, so I mean, it's, it is summer. It's very humid up here in the summer. Um, now, you know, this is this was a, a massive, I mean, this is a huge environment for these animals. So from start to finish, how many years, or was it years, to actually get this, uh, to achieve this? I would say from the time we began to uh, design it till we finished the job, it was three years. Three years? Yeah. Wow. All right. And That's required cool. tearing up a lot more than you see. Um, we have a lot of piping under the patio outside. And, uh, you know, one Just thing leads to another, and the first thing you know, a million here and a million there. <laughs> it oh, begins man. to add up. Yes, I bet it does. Ever, ever used to say. <laughs> well, this is just a fantastic animal, this male here. Uh, they are related, so, you know, being that you are an AZA accredited facility, they don't want related pairs to breed. Even though I suspect there's a lot of inbreeding on these small Indonesian islands, uh, we try to err on the safe side and we try to get unrelated uh, pairs uh, before we allow mating. If, if the female, for example, were to lay eggs, um, we would probably destroy the eggs and wait until we had an unrelated male to put with them. Gotcha. All right, good. Well, you know what, once again, I gotta thank you. You know, you've really rolled out the red carpet for us, and I really do appreciate it. It's my and, and you've always been an inspiration to me ever since I was a little, a little bit younger, not too much. I wasn't a pipsqueak coming here, but I was a young guy who didn't own a house, didn't have the facility I have now, but I was definitely inspired by gentlemen like Clyde. So guys, pay attention to what he's done and try and replicate that because I think your animals and yourself will be a lot happier for it. Thanks again, man. Okay. All right.